Hello, everyone. Welcome to another uh, cryptocurrency stock session. I'm your host, MA5, and glad to have with us crypto tax lawyer who will help us navigate the complex world of crypto taxation and answer users' questions. Thank you so much for joining us. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself to the community? Um, sure. Uh, hi, everybody. I am a crypto tax lawyer here on Reddit. Um, I've been involved in the crypto community um, as an investor um, for about eight years now. Um, so I wasn't there quite from the beginning. Uh, tried to download my first Bitcoin wallet back in 2010. I couldn't figure out how to get it mining, and I sort of just let it go. Um, that was a mistake. <laughs> but uh, here I am, 10 years later, uh, practicing uh, cryptocurrency tax. Been along for the ride throughout all the years of the ups and downs, the regulatory confusion, um, and now I'm able to sort of pursue a passion of mine uh, full time as a lawyer. So thanks for having me. Awesome, great. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, let's get started here. I'll quickly go through some of the comments, questions that users have asked already, and then uh, open this discussion up so that users can join and ask their questions. Those who have already mentioned the questions and comments, thank you so much. And we'll try to discuss some of the top ones from there. Let's first start with the hot topic that is the latest development around crypto taxation. I'm specifically talking about the infrastructure bill and the broker and cash reporting rules. So what do these new tax provisions mean and how much of a difference will it make for regular crypto users? I've read that it raises the bar for NFT transactions and high value transaction, but for an average regular user, what do these laws mean? Um, well, I guess off the bat, um, the immediate impact is gonna be next to nothing. Um, there's, uh, it's gonna take a year or two before any of this even comes into effect. So um, even though this was passed and you know there were amendments that were proposed that were shot down to try to rectify this, um, generally, um, the bill's major you know, impact on the crypto community isn't supposed to go into effect until 2024. So as of right now, there's not going to be a massive impact. But I think your average crypto user will start to see um, as that deadline gets closer and closer, um, if, especially if this isn't fixed or if the Treasury Department doesn't clarify um, some of the, the details around this, um, there may be a sort of chilling effect on the, the crypto development as um, it'll become almost cost prohibitive um, just to get through the regulatory tape for people to make projects in their dorm rooms. Like, like we've seen, you know, it's, it's pretty common early on in the, in the early years of crypto. Um, it still is very common, but um, as more regulatory hurdles sort of um, get imposed from Congress and, and regulatory bodies, I think you might start seeing a slowing down where the winners will truly be the winners and um, these extra hurdles and costs might might start uh, making it a little harder for people to launch their own their own projects. So, uh, but unless you're sort of dealing with tens of thousands of dollars at a time, which many crypto users do. I mean, if you bought one Bitcoin, you would have to sort of trade it away at currently in six different transactions. And so that could add a, a large cost um, to doing business with crypto. Great. So with the same amendment, there's another provision, which is the 6050i. So if you're using a centralized exchange like Coinbase, would users now have to report transaction over $10,000 directly to the IRS? Um, are you saying if they were to sell their crypto on a, a centralized exchange? Right. So if they're trading or selling crypto worth 10,000 or more, do they have to now manually report these transactions now, now that um, the code has been changed? Um, I don't think if you're using a centralized exchange, um, because there's a carve out within the, 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 the reporting requirement for banking institutions. And I believe most U.S. Um, crypto exchanges are already sort of being qualified as these, these institutions. And so um, I, I'm not 100% sure if using a centralized exchange, is, I, I, I highly doubt the users would have to report that, but it's, it's, it's something to be more concerned about with the DeFi space. 
because there isn't going to be a body in the DeFi space that is going to report to the to, to the authorities. And so if, you, if you're trading in a centralized exchange, they're probably already being registered in the USA as a banking institution. And so there's a separate carve out where they have to report it. Um, but as a user, um, especially in the DeFi space, this is sort of the big um, hurdle and the big shock to the entire, um, the way, I mean, it's really a foundation of cryptocurrency is not being anonymous anymore. So. Great. So from what I understand, a lot of the rule making still has to be done and people expect the treasury to come out with actual rules around these provisions. Uh, that's correct. And so this is something we see similarly with the IRS. Um, it's more my bread and butter is sort of IRS regulations. Um, you know, they give some guidance, but it's very sparse. And the guidance that is out there is generally always behind uh, the trends. And so hopefully this could be a good thing if, if uh, I know this is going to make some people's blood boil, but if the treasury handles this properly, and if Congress is able to go in and listen to the stakeholders within the, the, the crypto community, um, it is possible that the added clarity could make things a little bit easier. Um, it could make it easier to start a project, could make it easier to have the, the, the clarity to know for sure that you're in compliance with these, these laws. And it's, it's the unfortunate reality that many of the securities laws, the, the treasuries regulations, the tax code, these have been in existence for decades. And the definitions of certain things that go on in the crypto, the crypto space as a regular course of business just don't fit into any of the existing definitions in some of these, these regulations. And so maybe this is what um, it could, could open some doors, uh, but also you sort of have to trust the government regulators to know what they're talking about. And, you know, not saying they can't and they won't, but, um, just seeing how this was pushed through uh, by Congress with so little people within it that understood the the, the provision, um, you know, we'll have to see where it lands. Great. So let's now go to some of the other questions. So the one question a lot of users have asked is how are long-term holds taxed? These are basic taxation questions. What counts as a taxable event in general? And what information does one need to keep a track of? Is everyone required to use a tax reporting software or can they just keep track of trades in their own spreadsheet and report these to the IRS? Um, so before we get into sort of the, the, the basic uh, crypto, you know, what is taxable, what isn't, I have to give a little bit of a disclaimer here. Um, don't go relying on anything I say as, as being, you know, oh, my lawyer said blank. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I, I read in the comments that are uh, sometimes very fa fact specific. And so I just full disclaimer, um, if you if you have a question about some specific set of details, you need to reach out to a CPA or a tax attorney and, and have it run by them with your specific situation. That being said, <laughs> um, let's get into these questions. Um, so you sort of threw five or six at me there. Yeah. Um, you sort of talked so about long-term holdings. Long-term um, holdings, right. Okay, so long-term holdings, it's its anything that you held for over a year. So if you bought it on January 1st, um, you could sell it on January 2nd of the next year. Uh, and the benefit of that is that long-term holdings, it's just, uh, you get taxed less. The incentive is to have investors invest in companies. Um, and if you invest longer, uh, the, the thought process is that you should be rewarded by paying a little bit less in taxes if your investment pays off. Uh, so there's a little bit of a perk to not just playing swing trades overnight. So in the crypto space, um, it, it's really important to keep track of your holdings and your cost basis because uh, there's times where, especially if there's multiple cycles of booms and busts, a lot of people might have gotten in um, this cycle uh, in, in you know February or March of this year, or maybe they got in April or May, and now that the market's sort of gone back up again, there's sort of a, a question about, do you realize your gains now that we're at all time highs, or do you try to hold off for three more months to see if you can qualify for long-term gains? Um, the long-term gains top tax bracket is, I think it's 15% lower or close to that than, than the short-term top bracket. And that 15% might not seem like a lot if you're dealing with, you know, a few thousand dollars in gains, but if you have 
of substantial amounts of, of money on the line, um, you know, it really adds up quick. So generally we'll tell people, um, you know, if you can get the long-term gains, if you can hold out for a year, that's the easiest way to save on uh, crypto taxes. Great. So the next question on a similar lines is, what information do I need to keep track of and provide to the IRS? Is every user required to use a tax reporting software? That's any dedicated software for reporting, or can they just you know keep track of trades on their own spreadsheet and document it themselves? Um, so you don't need to use any dedicated software. Um, some of the, the the stuff on the market um, is is pretty reliable, depending on the types of transactions you're doing. But uh, generally, you can do it in your own spreadsheet if you're willing to do the you know the work of tracking your trades. Um, the the information you you need to keep track of is when you bought your crypto, what price you bought it at, um, and the price would be in U.S. dollars. That's all really the IRS cares about. So it's um, what kind of crypto, how much was it, so your volume, and what you paid for it. Uh, and that's when you open your position, so it's when you purchase it. And then what you report to the IRS is, is not your purchases, what you report in, in the end is your gains. So then you're also going to need to know when you sold your crypto and what the proceeds of that sale were. Um, if you collect all of this data, you can report it on your own. You'd, you'd fill it out on form 8949, and that would show um, the day you bought it, how much crypto you bought, what US dollar price you bought it at, the day you sold it, what you sold it for, and then you just have a line there showing the difference. And you'd calculate that based on your short-term gains and your long-term gains, and that's what you'd report to the IRS. So yes, theoretically, you could uh, keep track of your own trades. And if you're a light crypto trader, it might make sense just have an Excel spreadsheet open and sort of run down the list. But there are um, plenty of softwares on the market right now that um, they're relatively affordable, I think. Um, and you can plug in your ETH wallets, your, your centralized exchanges um, automatically and sort of have it all done for you after the fact if you're not interested in tracking it all year long. Great. So next question, one another common question that many have asked is, how are staking rewards taxed? Especially if they are automatically compounded and you know the user never withdraws them, what do what do we need to know so that we can plan our trades around this? Uh, sure. So staking, um, this is where sort of the terms get a little um, a little gray. Uh, sometimes a project will call it staking. It might be something different. Um, but generally staking rewards, it's taxes income as it comes into your, your possession. Now, the question often is when does it, when is it considered in your control? Because that's sort of the metric that the IRS uses. It's, it's your dominion and control. And that's something where um, it's very specific to the project. Um, there are times where you might get um, staking rewards that may be locked up for some amount of time. You may, be, you may be receiving staking rewards that you don't know how much you receive um, and you're not going to know until you cash out. And there may be staking rewards that are just given to you, you know, periodically, every block or every day or every week. Um, and so when you realize control over those is, is generally the, the question. But the, the thing that's not a question is, is it's taxed as income. <laughs> so, uh, and at, the, at, at my firm, we sort of treat it as um, taxes, income, but it's not subject to self-employment tax. But that's not something the IRS has said. It's more of a, an omission. And so it's definitely taxes, income, though. So the, the specifics will be, um, it, it, it really is project to project. So it's hard to say for sure. But generally, um, yeah, it's income, and then it's just a matter of figuring out when you control it. Great. So how are freebies taxes? Again, another basic question how are freebies tax for example coinbase on or, or moons or bad which people reward get rewarded for just browsing and rewards aren't on crypto debit and credit cards how are these taxed and is there a 600 dollars minimum that people need to keep in mind before before like using these products and before filing their taxes on these um, okay, so there's a um, three, or I guess 
the 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 crypto earn program through like Coinbase that would also be income. Um, freebies could be airdrops. Someone just gives you free free crypto. Mm -hmm. uh, we you would also report that as income as well. Um, and then for credit debit card rewards, this is actually this goes back to the 1950s. There's a case. I think it had to do with um, milk rebates for purchasing milk. That appears to be the best authority on this. And it effectively says that, uh, and that sort of informed how credit card rewards have been taxed over the years. And um, the tax court has pretty much said that um, credit card rewards are considered rebates on the purchase that triggers the reward. So the question there is, um, were you given the, the reward as a sign-up bonus or was it triggered by some specific purchase? If it's a sign-up bonus, like, hey, open an account, you know, with, with uh, crypto.com and you'll get $100 worth of crypto for free, that would be considered income. But if it's um, a cash back percentage, you know, 2% cash back and you buy something at the store, um, when you get that reward, it's technically, according to the, 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 the previous tax rules, um, what's considered a rebate. And so it, it's likely a non-taxable rebate. Now, this is from the 1950s, sort of uh, the genesis of this thought process. And so there are extra steps involved for the crypto side. You have to track, you know, when it enters your holdings, when you sell it, it's, it's not as, comp you know, you can't just not follow it. But it gen generally, if it's a, a rebate for a purchase you made, um, it'd be tax free. Uh, and this, this is something I did notice uh, reading up on the new tax bill is the definition of the digital asset. Um, I haven't read into it as far as I, you know, I probably should for this this, this event. But um, I, I was curious reading that if 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 airline miles are considered a digital asset because um, that's sort of the 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 analog to, you know, crypto was these sort of credit card miles and the courts had pretty much said, we're not going to touch those. It's too difficult to, to track the value. Um, and now that they're putting in this wide sweeping language about digital assets, I can't help but wonder if it's going to mess up decades of sort of credit card rewards um, rules. Um, but it's something to look into. I'm, I'm not sure. Great, great. So again, another question that has come from users is, Again, liquidity provisions as LP positions, how are these treated? These are generally positions that constantly accrue in our wallets and they don't show up as individual transactions. So how, how should these be treated when filing for taxes? Should I be snapshotting my wallet on a timely basis or do these rewards accrue and get taxed at the time of withdrawal? Um, so it really depends on the data that's sort of available. Um, if someone did take snapshots and they knew, um, the, you know, the exact day what their their holdings would have been, um, you know, it it theoretically it, it could be possible you can calculate it that way. But generally, when someone enters a liquidity pool position, they don't know what the ratio is at any given time of the crypto within that that liquidity pool. Um, so there's 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 if you had the data and you could figure out any given day what your position was and you wanted to track it on uh, you know, sort of a daily basis, uh, maybe you could, uh, but that's a lot of work. Um, and, and maybe not everyone has that ability and not every project allows that um, sort of snapshot to be taken. Um, so generally when, when people enter liquidity pools and we have to figure out sort of the tax implications, um, you know, like on Uniswap, you'll receive a Uniswap token when you put in your your pair into the liquidity pool, and what we sort of consider that is is a sale of your assets. You're buying that liquidity pool token, and then when you exit that position, the U.S. dollar value um, that that went into purchasing that liquidity pool token is sort of the dollar value of your cost basis. And then when you sell it for other assets, that's how you realize the gain entering and leaving the liquidity pool. Um, there are other ways to do it. Um, as you sort of mentioned, taking snapshots, there are ways to see, um, you know, how much of a difference there was on each, each side of the pairing. Um, but this is where it's sort of, uh, you know, taxes becomes a bit of an art form and it's not necessarily straight math, uh, particularly in the crypto side. Um, I would love nothing more than for the IRS to, to clarify what they want out of liquidity pools. 
but we're not quite there yet. Yeah, it can definitely be confusing for someone just starting in crypto to have so much to do in terms of tax issue. Another similar question is bridging coins from one chain to another. Are these taxed or is it treated as a non-taxable event? For example, if I buy ETH and stake it on a pool, I'll get ETH2, which is the staking token. Are these events taxable? Um, so it's possible, uh, but generally, if it's truly a one-to-one, -one, you're just wrapping a token on another blockchain. Say you go uh, Bitcoin to wrapped Bitcoin on the ETH platform. Um, it's it's one of those rare circumstances where it may be the situation where you sort of treat it as a non-taxable, um, sort of a like kind, you know, it's ETH, it's ETH. And then the market data um, sort of does play a, a role here where, you know, the price of wrapped Bitcoin very rarely uh, diverges from Bitcoin. Um, there are other situations, though, where um, the project might call it wrapping or bridging or pegging or something like that. Uh, but if the token you're receiving has any extra attributes, if there's something involved in it that maybe isn't a one-to-one -to -one token, you know, mirroring the token, um, and there's always sort of that argument where if you have you know true Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain and you move it to ETH, um, just having a faster transaction speed, is that qualify as enough of a difference to uh, make it a taxable like a new token? Um, and that's one of those those questions we sort of answer all the time at the firm because new projects have different attributes. And just because they call it uh, bridging doesn't mean it's always non-taxable, uh, but it, it it could be and it could not be. It really is, is token specific uh, and, and the project to project. But if you went from ETH to ETH2, um, you know, it's it's Ethereum. And so we would say, you know, or I, I would sort of have to say that it probably wouldn't be. And for things like Bitcoin, rat Bitcoin, it wouldn't be. But for some other stuff, it might be. Great. So another question is, how are gas fees calculated? Do Are they treated as expenses? And for example, if the profit position goes into loss because of the gas fees paid on the transaction, can it be captured as reductions in the taxes? Um, so deductions, uh, probably not, but one way you could do it, um, and so we, we treat it, would be if you're selling the token on an exchange and there's a fee associated with that, that you would include that either against the proceeds of the, the, the trade or you'd add it to the cost basis of what you're buying. And so that way, the fee amount is included in the cost basis or the proceeds of the transaction. And so for those trades, you are sort of um, deducting uh, or you're crediting the transaction with the US dollar value of that fee. Uh, but for other fees, just uh, moving from wallet to wallet, it becomes a lot uh, more difficult to sort of track because it's not associated with the actual sale um, and then adding the fees to any one token to figure out um, for the purposes of accounting uh, becomes very cumbersome. And, and that's not something that we, we would sort of recommend or do. But if you're selling something or buying something, um, you should be able to include the fee amount in the cost basis or uh, against the proceeds of, of that, that sale or purchase to make sure you're sort of realizing some of that um, on your taxes. Great, thank you so much. Now let's slowly open up the conversation to the users who have joined us and listening here. So I've invited some of the users. If you would like to ask any questions, please you could unmute yourself and uh, ask them. Hello. Um, so this question is going to be kind of behalf on my boss since he doesn't use a Reddit. Um, we uh, do data center hosting and have put some mining rigs in our data center is sort of some passive income. Uh, this is kind of a two part question. The first part is as far as expenses go on mining rigs um, is the only expense that you can write off is when you initially purchase the equipment to mine on or is there any sort of depreciation of 
hard, like the value of the hardware? Is there any sort of depreciation that you can also submit on your taxes? Uh, second part of the question is when we're mining Ethereum uh, as an example, um, we don't immediately get those payouts. We tend to let our pending balance uh, grow as large as we can. That way, whenever we get uh, a payout, uh, the gas fees don't impact us as much. Um, let's say, for an example, we had two Ethereum as a pending balance at the end of the tax year, but that Ethereum balance is still pending on the pool and has not been sent to our wallet yet. Is that pending balance something that is still taxable or is it ignored because it hasn't been paid out to our wallet yet? Um, all right, let's see. Um, so if you're running a mining rig, um, keep track of your electricity. There are other things that you can write off um, when, you're, when you're running an operation like this. Um, a lot of our clients, uh, they do if they do decide to do the mining operation, is they'll sort of set up their own LLC, and some of them will put solar panels up, and they'll they'll really put into the infrastructure for it. And um, there there is there is other things you can add to the expenses of running a mining rig beyond just your initial purchase. Um, so definitely. Um, and then the second question for uh, the payouts, I guess my my immediate question would be if you know how much you're owed then you know what your income was. Um, and just because it's, it hasn't yet hit your wallet, it, it's, it hit your account, right? You know what you owe. And so yeah. that, that's sort of my thought process, but it, it could depend on uh, the way the, the, the pool is set up. Uh, if, if you truly didn't know, say it was a percentage of the pool or something, and you didn't truly know how many tokens you were owed, um, maybe it'd be a different question. But I'd say if if... If there's a two ETH balance, whenever that balance you know was added to, if it's uh, every five days, ten days, or whatever, um, then you would be realizing that gain, um, and you should be reporting it um, because it's already been sort of credited to you, and you can pull it out at any time you want, and so it, you control it. Yeah. So even even though most pools have it set up to where your pending balance is more of a I owe you until you hit the button to pay it out to your wallet. Since we know what the exact amount paid out would be, let's say that, you know, at the end of this tax year, we had two Ethereum as a pending payout, but we haven't hit the button to pay it out to our wallet yet because we know that we have a pending payout of two Ethereum. That's something that would still be taxable because we know exactly how much we would have been paid out if we were to hit that payout button at that specific date. Is that what you're is that what you're getting at? Um, yeah, sort of. And I would say it'd be something akin to, um, you know, a tip jar at the end of the night at a bar, right? Hey, the money in the tip jar is yours. If you if you don't pull it out of the tip jar. You know, can you not consider it your money? Is sort of my question. And so, if you leave the if there's the money in the tip jar until the new year, when you know exactly there's you know five thousand dollars in it, um, you know that's just that's my thought process. Now, if it's if it's a, a substantial amount of money and it's a, a real question, you should definitely talk to someone in more detail about the specifics, uh, because um, you know it's hard to know just carrying over to the new year. There might be something. Uh, I'm not sure, depending on the pool or, or how, how it manifests. But to me, just right now, it seems almost like you sort of, the only reason that you claim you don't own it is because you haven't picked it off the ground yet. And it's, you know, you can pull it out, so. Yeah, the, 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 tip, jar, the tip jar analogy was like, that, that was pretty insightful. So that, that answered my question on that. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. All right, um, thank you so much. Sure, please ask a question, yeah. Yeah, uh, so my question's actually, it's probably like pretty simple and I, I think you guys might have um, actually answered and there might have been some technical terms that I missed, but so uh, some exchanges, like for, I think it might be all exchanges, but for instance, like with Coinbase, uh, where you can kind of convert from one cryptocurrency to another. Um, so this might be something that um, like, uh, for instance, some people did where they converted like a portion of their Bitcoin to either Ether or 
uh, Blue Light or even um, Cardano or whatever. Um, is it that only when we kind of like cash out, like, you know, uh, completely sell those crypto, uh, like sell those crypto coins and um, like maybe not transferred back to our bank, but just sell them to like the US dollar that it gets taxed? Or is the process of switching from one uh, cryptocurrency to another also taxed? Um, so crypto to crypto transactions are mm -hmm. taxable. So this is a big question back in the early days, 2013, 2014. Um, and the IRS has come down and clarified that Bitcoin to ETH um, is a taxable event. Um, and technically, even like a USDT to USDC would be a taxable event, um, even though the prices would ever, you know, rarely vary by more than a half a penny. Um, so those those all would be you know, reportable events uh, that you should be keep, keeping track of. Now, there are some times where there's a swap that may be an untaxable swap. So... Um, there was a token VEN, it became VET, um, and there was a certain exchange rate, I think it was 101, and that's sort of um, almost like a stock split where it's not a taxable event. So um, not every time you transfer token to token is taxable, but on the, on the whole, if you're trading crypto for another crypto, uh, you should be tracking that as a taxable event. Okay, thanks. Okay, I, I don't mean to butt in on his question, but... Uh how exactly would that be taxed? You know, if I'm trading ETH to Bitcoin, you know, and I'm trading $5,000 worth, if I'm trading $5,000 worth of one token and getting $5,000 worth of another token, it's the exact same cash value. It's just two separate tokens. So how exactly is that taxed? Uh, sure. So um, this is where it, uh, it's very important to keep track of when you bought a token and what you paid for it. So in your analogy here, uh, just keeping ETH to Bitcoin, if you have $5,000 worth of ETH and you bought that ETH last year for $500 and then you're selling it for Bitcoin, you're now realizing you know, the unrealized gains. If you bought the ETH for 500, now it's 5,000. There's $4,500 of capital gains you're realizing when you sell it into Bitcoin. Now, the Bitcoin is going to have a cost basis of $5,000, but the ETH cost basis was much lower, and that's how you calculate your gains. It's what you paid for the ETH, and that's what you sold it for. And you're right. It is sometimes confusing because, you know, that's, the software has a pretty easy, easy job of, uh, does a pretty good job of tracking the cost of these tokens at any given time. But if you just have an Excel spreadsheet, you're not going to know what the exchange rate of ETH was, you know, two years ago. So uh, it's important to keep track of your buys and sells uh, and, and uh, sort of keep accounting like that. But that's how you do that. I've got a question that's kind of relevant to this topic. Do you mind if I ask that now? Yeah, go for it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, a lot of different cryptocurrency tax softwares have... Um, taking different uh, approaches to keeping track of cost basis pools. And I'm curious to get your insight on like, do you feel that uh, it's necessary to track cost basis pools within different sources of data? Like let's say I'm buying Bitcoin on Coinbase and on like BlockFi. And in some cryptocurrency tax softwares, they'll use accounting methods like specific ID to create cost basis pools that are universal across all of those platforms. And in other ones, they will actually break it out between like a Coinbase Bitcoin cost basis pool and a BlockFi Bitcoin cost basis pool. And if somebody's using tax software that, um, you know, does that as a universal basis versus uh, specific lots between the different softwares, do you think that the individual has any liability with the IRS if they call them out on that. And the other aspect of this is like, what other things should people be looking for in cryptocurrency tax software to make sure that they're taking care of all of the, you know, onus or liability that's on them as an individual? Um, so let me break that up. Um, so generally, uh, for everyone listening, um, the IRS has sort of flagged two ways of doing accounting for crypto. One of them is called FIFO or first in, first out. And in my experience, most tax softwares will default to this. This is FIFO. And what that just means is your oldest crypto of any particular you know, token type is sold first. 
Um, and a lot of softwares will do this uh, universally across your entire holdings. So if you have some on Bitcoin, some in a cold wallet, some on you know Binance, um, your entire asset portfolio will be taken to, into account. Um, and he, uh, sorry, uh, who was this? TRW, is it you? Or six straight, yeah. sorry. Uh, yeah, he great. mentioned something called specific identification. And this is something else the IRS has said is, is acceptable in the crypto space. And that's effectively saying, you know exactly what you purchased a particular token for, um, and you can identify it specifically. And so this would allow you to say, this lot of tokens I bought in 2014 has been in cold storage since 2014, and I was trading in a hot wallet on a Binance account. I'm not going to include that that specifically identified crypto within my normal you know accounting standards. Um, so I, I forgot your your question. It was um, yeah. So I'm just trying to understand the liability, like, right? Was that it? Yeah, just the liability on the individual if the crypto tax software is using specific ID, but they're using universal lots because they've taken the position that it's not possible to break them out into specific locations when it comes to actual accounting for the disposal and the cost basis lot? Um, that's a, you know, that might be one of those things that the IRS agent <laughs> would have to determine. Um, I, I assure you there's not a whole lot of guidance on that. Um, but it, it would seem if you're reasonably relying on a crypto software um, and you're trying your best and your, your gains and losses are um, you know, seem accurate to you based on you know reality. Um, the one thing to be sort of, I would default to is uh, using first in first out is sort of the gold standard. Um, and then consistency is also key. Uh, there was some confusion a few years back about using LIFO or last in first out. Um, and the accounting standards have been clarified. It's FIFO or specific identification. And so if you're sort of flip-flopping year over year to see, oh, I'm going to, I'm a spec ID this year. I'm going to do FIFO this year. Um, that could cause some issues. But if you're in good faith relying on your crypto software and you're not doing some sort of um, shenanigans to sort of cherry pick the lowest crypto treatment every year, um, I, I would be pretty pretty surprised if you were you know personally penalized or, or, or you know dragged out. But if you were flagged for an audit, they might say you did it wrong and you might have to go back and fix it. Uh, but I, I'm not sure if, if if you will be personally liable for what uh, you reasonably relied on. But if you have that question, I mean, that's definitely something to look at the, the numbers. I mean, there's a huge disparity. Uh, maybe reach out to a CPA and, and see what your options are. Because um, uh, Also, what software are you talking about that sort of does this spec ID? Um, um, so so I, I actually work in this industry, so I don't want to... Uh, like okay. specifically call out any names, but no, good um, idea. DM me, DM me, because I'm also uh, I have I have subscriptions to a whole lot of software, and I'm just curious what the what the option is because that's something that um, hasn't sort of been brought been brought up to me before. So, thanks. Can I can I ask a question, kind of bouncing off this? <clears throat> what what if you just haven't kept track over the course of that the question. year? <laughs> Oh, yeah. you know, I, 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 say, I will what say, I will say you're probably, I'd say you're probably the only person uh, in the country that has <laughs> not been keeping close track of their crypto activity <laughs> since 2015. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah, you can get an award for that. Um, so what you should do is, um, I guess your first step would be to sort of figure out what platforms you used, um, figure out what wallets you used, even if you don't have them anymore. Just think back because this is often something that when people come to me uh, for help, um, it's, it's typically, uh, the, 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 the fact pattern is usually, I got into it at some point, in either 2015, 2014, or 2017, more likely, and I ended up losing a bunch of money in 2018. I didn't think I had to pay taxes, it was losses, and now I have a bunch of money. Um, and what we sort of would do is sort of help walk through and figure out what platforms did you use? Um, what data can you access? Um, and then what wallets did you have? Uh, if it's something on the Ethereum platform, for example, um, you can pull all of the data going back years. Even if it's an old wallet that you maybe, you know, haven't used in two years, it could be tied to your, your Coinbase account in some way uh, in the old transaction history. 
and you can sort of do a little bit of a blockchain crawl and, and figure out which one was yours. Um, and and generally, what we would recommend is, especially if you've you know in this current cycle, if you're holding tokens long enough, you know you could have been in the red for a very long time, and now you have substantial amounts of money. Um, we would say go back and um, calculate your your gains from the beginning. Um, and square up with the IRS, you could file amended taxes going backwards. Uh, generally, the IRS has a statute of limitations. It's three years um, just off the bat. And then if they if there's a gross underreport of your taxes, uh, they can go back six years. And if they suspect fraud, like criminal fraud, they can go back indefinitely. So um, there's sort of a cost benefit analysis about going back all the way to like 2012 for Bitcoin wallets you have no recollection of and you use Mt. Gox, right? But you should at least flag that and, and know, you know, what you bought and maybe check your bank records, uh, check your emails, do something because there are ways to build out your lost data uh, that many people don't think about that um, could help fill those gaps in. And it could be the difference between paying short-term capital gains on you know a Bitcoin sale, and being able to have enough evidence to prove that it was long term, and that could be a huge difference. So, all right. So I'm gonna find an opportunity to jump in here. Cryptocurrency was originally created as a, a way of giving people an anonymous kind of give power back to the people. This is a worldwide phenomenon. What gives the government any right to assume responsibility over the sort of ongoings of the cryptocurrency world? Exactly. Um, well, sorry guys, uh, I, I also was there in the early days, so don't I, I fully understand the the, uh, the sort of libertarian streak lives on. Um, but the question was, what gives the, the government authority to inter intrude in sort of the, yeah, the crypto space? Yeah, they've done nothing to affect or or contribute, or they never even functioned in the creation of the original Bitcoin. They've done nothing other than try to you know tax the money right. simply because. Hey, we're citizens. Uh, that's exactly, it's the lawyer in me now. Uh, yeah, you're right. They're the sovereign and you are the, the governed. And so if they tell you, report your crypto taxes, uh, that is your obligation. Um, that's that's their legal authority. They that's, have the authority it, to, they, well, I mean, they have the authority to draft you into war. Uh, they could do a lot of things. And so the you're right, it seems unfair uh, but that's also the argument that any industrialist would say is this is my company. I built it. Um, and then their argument would be no, because we funded the internet. We funded the roads. We allowed this to happen. And so I, I fully understand that the government did very little <laughs> to uh, facilitate the growth of this amazing once in a century kind of development. And personally, I think we're still in the early stages of it. Oh, it's yeah. just it's just now, you know, Goldman Sachs is lobbying Congress to sort of make things a little easier for banks. It's just now getting to the point where the, the real big moneyed interests are um, making it known that they're getting their fingers in this. And this could be like a situation of the Internet, you know, in 1990, where no one really understands where it's going to be in 15, 20, 30 years. And so... I think the technology itself is going to be more ubiquitous than um, even crypto enthusiasts really believe. And that um, right now it's sort of a, it goes through phases of speculation and, and things like that. But uh, to sort of touch on that, it's sort of a unpopular opinion, but the crypto, the crypto industry itself um, hasn't exactly made it easy to pay taxes. And since I am a tax lawyer, I have to say, if the government was getting paid 100% of the taxes they felt they were owed, there would be less regulation. They wouldn't have a need to put their finger in, in, into things. And so it's sort of a, it's a, it's a sword and a shield kind of thing where the anonymity of it is, is a great shield for scrutiny. But then also it's sort of a reason um, for the government to say, no, we need regulations. Because for every pump and dump, every rug pull, that sort of adds fuel to the, the the argument that they have to protect people. Uh, now, we all know, most of us know at least, um, you know, crypto has always been the wild west. You shouldn't trust anything you see, you know, unless it's your keys, it's not your crypto, right? But uh, it's sort of the, it's the government's thing. You know, they always have to sort of get involved. But yeah, the answer to your question is they can because they said they can. And that's unfortunately the way we're at. Yeah. yeah. At least thank you for your answer. Thank you for the insight. Thank you. I, 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 
Oh, um, sorry. I just wanted to quickly add, I'd also want to add that like, it's probably also to, I guess, like prevent like um, little tax loopholes or tax safe havens for like the ultra rich. So you don't have, and this is, this is only like me giving my opinion. So you don't have like one guy like Elon Musk kind of like affecting like the price of Bitcoin because he bought like 1.2 billion, but this is completely off topic. Yeah. Can I jump in on rug pulls? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I actually was just um, involved in a NFT uh, uh, transaction. It was called the Tokyo 10, and it was 10,000 NFTs minted, a beautiful website, a, a roadmap, um, Discord, Twitter, the whole nine yards. It launched in mid-October. And I went away over the weekend, came back, and it was gone. The Discord was gone. The Twitter was gone. Like, it just disappeared. And um, my question is, and I think I know the answer, if you uh, purchase NFTs and they lose value to zero and you're not able to sell them, are you out of luck? Um, so the uh, – well – there's there's two arguments here. The if you if you have a, a worthless asset like that, um, there was a law passed in 2017. It's the the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and it sort of um, made it harder to write off losses due to uh, theft. Uh, it's a huge one in the crypto space. Uh, fat fingering something, um, and sort of rug pulls is sort of one of those those issues where it's it's sort of a fraud, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and they're saying. Uh, this new, it's it's in effect since uh, 2017, um, so you're not allowed to write that off. Now, there is another argument, though, that you could say, um, you know, sort of crypto exists outside of that legislation because it's special, um, where maybe you can get your cost basis. Um, you can write off your cost basis as a loss, but that's not something that you should do without um, sort of the advice of a tax professional because it's not necessarily... Uh, in the code, it's more of those more like uh, like the wash sale rule. It's sort of it doesn't apply to crypto, not because they said it doesn't apply. It's it's more so just um, sort of a legal argument that it's it's sort of not hasn't been included properly. And so there's this other argument. But um, sorry to hear that you had your your the, the rug pull. I know this last week or two weeks, I've gotten calls from clients and they're like, hey, I got was involved in a rug pull. There's another one. There was a hacking. There was all kinds of stuff going on. And so there are things maybe you can do, but um, if that's the situation and it's a substantial amount of money, I would say definitely seek a professional to help you walk you through it. Because if you do it on your own and, and you're wrong, um, then you could be penalized significantly more than if you had um, the advice of somebody, uh, like a tax professional helping you. So. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. I got a question on uh, basically I've been buying and selling like crazy since I started yeah, just six months ago, having a great time, losing tons, making tons. And sometimes I would just sell everything if I thought there was going to be a dip, wait till it dips and then get back in again. And now I'm looking at, you know, finding out all those gains and all those losses. I can, you know, write off 3,000 in losses, but then I'm, I feel like it, it, the wash gain thing doesn't apply. So, Am I responsible for all of those gains every time I, I sold and made money? But then does it equal out with losses towards um, the end? And then sure. someone said that I should sell at the before the end of the year and wait one month and a day before getting back in. So the wash sale rule does not apply to crypto at the moment. And so... The watch sale rule, uh, if you trade stocks or, or options, this is 2021. That was the big thing earlier on this year. Um, it, 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 for stocks, it, it's effectively, if, you, if you're holding a position and you sell it uh, and you realize losses, you're not allowed to realize those losses unless you wait a certain amount of time. And it's effectively just to stop people from selling their stocks, buying them back the next day, the same position, and then writing off for tax purposes the loss and just lowering the cost basis of the new the new position, uh, sort of in quotes. Uh, so for crypto, this is sort of the um, it doesn't apply by omission, um, and so you could 
um, sort of sell your crypto, realize the losses, and then buy them back the next day, same position. And just the way they sort of crafted the crypto rules previously, they didn't really think it through all the way. And it sort of left the door open for this tax treatment. Uh, but to answer your ultimate question, your gains and losses on the year, they they net out. So that means you, you have your gains, you deduct your losses, uh, and that's what you pay taxes on. Nice. So if you, ha if you had $10,000 in gains, or hopefully for you, $10 million in gains, <laughs> and <laughs> $3 million in losses, uh, you only pay taxes on the $7 million that you, you kept. And then vice versa, if you <laughs> lost $7 million, and you you gained you know five, then you you'd realize losses of two, and you can carry those forward into different years uh, moving ahead until you capture back those gains. But I need to sell before the end of the year to realize to to zero out or whatever it is, right? Uh, well, if you kept track of your your trades throughout the year, you could know where you're at right now. Yeah, so, it's all done on one exchange, so they should give me some sort of something to put into like Coin Tracker. I don't know if that's a good one or not. But uh, yeah, coin tracker is fine. And if it's straight swap, like straight straight trades, I, I can't uh, can't name a software that can't do those uh, pretty pretty well. Um, and so what you could do is see where you're at now, and you might realize, um, hey, I'm actually negative, or hey, I'm pretty even, right? I only owe taxes on on two thousand dollars worth of gains. I'm not going to sell because if I sell now, I'll realize even more gains, uh, and then you'll you'll sort of incur those those extra taxes. And this is sort of, especially towards the, the latter part of the year here, we're down to the last two months. Um, this is tax planning season. This is when you sort of need to calculate um, how many gains or how many losses you need to realize, how much in losses you realize before the end of the year. And you don't have to wait till the last day. <laughs> you can do it now. Um, and then, you know, if, it, if things pop in the next few months and you decide you want to realize gains, fine. But um, yeah, I wouldn't sell everything unless you know it's all a loss. But right now we're at all-time highs. So if you were to sell everything, you'd probably realize a whole bunch of gains um, without even really knowing what what you're doing. So if I were you, I would run your numbers through a tax software, see what you're at on the year um, as far as your gains, losses, and then sort of make that decision from there. And all those fees that – can I write those – add up all the fees and write them off as a business cost? Sort of, uh, so we sort of – we sort of went off of that uh, a little bit earlier, but um, this, depending on the software, they'll actually include that in your cost basis and your proceeds. Uh -huh. So if you spend $5 you know, in transaction fees and you buy $10 worth of crypto, um, you, the, the cost basis could be adjusted to say you actually paid $15 for that crypto. And it's not going to be a deduction like on your tax forms, but within the cost basis of the crypto, you will have already included those fees. So when you sell it for $20, instead of realizing the $10 that you thought you bought it for, you're actually only realizing $5 gains because you paid the fee. So, but that's, it depends on the software, I think, but um, generally that's how you would do the, the, the trading fees like that. Mm, fantastic. Thanks, man. May I, may I jump in on this? I have a question that pertains to the last few topics in the sort of conglomeration. Sure. Uh, so recently the, the crypto space has been kind of merging with the gaming space and now there's DeFi games out there such as like DeFi Kingdoms and whatnot. And I have a question pertaining to the NFTs. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people were airdropped these uh, certain tokens that were required to say mint the other NFTs, but they were given to us for free. And then the market was established for them and you kind of need these to create the other NFTs. But say you never swap them, never do anything. How do you account that for your cost basis if they never want the market? Right. And so this is something that happens often with new tokens. So I guess my question, I mean, the calculation would be, is there truly no market? You know, when they were airdropped to you, was there no value assigned to them? Uh, the yeah. value could be somewhere in a white paper. The value could be um, sort of a, uh, you know, a DeFi exchange somewhere. Um, and, and that's sort of dependent on the data. But if they were given to you and there was no market and so there's no value, then you would consider it income, but it'd be income at zero dollars. So what is that? It'd probably look like a buy on your, on your, you know, sort of on your, your calculation, a uh, non-taxable, you know, entry into your possession. Um, and then when you spend them or sell them or however you use them to, to mint, um, if the U.S. dollar value has gone up, 
um, that could be it could set the cost basis of the token that you minted. I'm not sure what what project you're talking about, but if it's um, if, if it's a lot of money, like if you're doing this a lot, then a lot of people make a lot of money. I'm like, uh, yeah, lately actually, I've been doing thousands of dollars of transactions every day, and I actually right. have none of those, but I've been doing thousands of dollars of transactions with no actual money that I have now. So that's why my question, another one that leads to is, uh, say you donate one of these uh, minted NFTs and they had an established uh, cost basis, what do you do with that considering that you will have to pay taxes on it, but you don't have any of that because you gave it away per se? Well, you have to, you have to sort of keep in mind when you receive it, it, it might have no, no, um, if it truly has no market, right? Then there's no U.S. dollar value for it. At the moment um, that it was, uh, the moment that it was released, right? But then when you when you sell it later or you donate it, then it, it inherently has value, right? And so, um, donations of crypto are a little more difficult because they're, they're technically property, and so you would need to get them appraised. You would have to have first find a charitable organization that will accept it. Um, so it's not as easy um, as, as just donating cash. But you could donate it, possibly, um, and then they like, really, uh, the calculation, though. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, like for example, if I gave my like uh, whatever NFT to a buddy, but I gave it to him for free, but say uh, it has you know quite a value that it and it also had a cost basis that I had. So that would be uh, more of a gift, right? But it would need to be like a no strings attached gift, and you're allowed to gift your crypto away. Um, if it's under fifteen thousand dollars, there's nothing to report to the IRS, and your buddy that you give it to will uh, sort of inherit your cost basis and your holding period. So if you are going to give gifts away like that, you do need to sort of give your buddy that information. So when he goes to sell it, he's not hit taking uh, all of the gains, you know, on on the chin. Because if you paid two hundred dollars for it, and he sells it for a thousand. Um, and he doesn't know what you paid for it. He's gonna uh, be expected to pay gains on the entire thousand uh, dollars. But you can give so those away. Can, but it would not be right. my responsibility anymore. Then, in which case, it wouldn't um, be my responsibility anymore. Uh, right. And if he sold it, it would be on his, you know, his taxes and all that. But you would need to make sure you track because if you don't track where it went and say this was a gift. And you were audited. The IRS might say, "Well, that looks an awful lot like a sale, <laughs> or like you spent it. Like, where did it go?" And if you don't have uh, documentation saying, "I gifted it on this day to my friend for you know, I bought it this much money. It was worth this much the day I gifted it." You know, it's sort of it's called a gift letter, um, and that's something that you should be sort of looking into if you're going to go this route. And then also keep in mind yeah. that gifts gifts need to be no strings attached. So it would be a, a, a you know, here's an NFT. It's yours. Do with do with it what you will. Um, it can't just be a sort of a, a loophole or a roundabout way to sort of spread spread the tax burden. But um, if you're really going to give your buddy, you know, a thousand dollars, you could give him a thousand dollars worth of crypto, and he could sell it and realize the gains on it. Uh, that's something that's completely allowed. <clears throat> Can I ask you a question? Sure. Is there a way to use crypto in which you do not have any tax liability to the U.S. government? Yes. Uh, don't be a U.S. citizen. One. <laughs> um, right. One way you could do um, this is something that uh, some people you know look into. It's putting up as collateral for a loan. Um, a lot of people uh, are generally putting up collateral and receiving loaned money or loaned crypto in this case, um, if if done properly and paid back properly, uh, doesn't trigger any taxable event. So let's say you bought Bitcoin at $100 because you're smarty pants from back in the day. Uh, <laughs> you, you don't want to sell it, but you really want to buy a house, right? <laughs> and you hate taxes. You could put up the Bitcoin as collateral. Uh, there are plenty of places on, on the crypto space that'll, that'll take crypto as collateral. And I think as of this week, Bank of America is talking about doing it. We'll see how long that takes. But you could put it up as collateral. Um, receive U.S. dollars, receive some other, sort of other crypto, uh, and then have cash on hand to either invest further or, you know, spend. And then you will just have to keep up on your interest payments and sort of hope you don't get liquidated. 
because uh, you, you might be able to sort of take out the loan, you might be able to spend the cash on your own, but if you get liquidated, it will sort of retroactively treat it as a sale. And so not only do you not have the cash anymore because you spent it, but then you also lost your crypto and have to pay taxes on it. So, but it is possible. And some people have done this, um, you know, some platforms offer really low interest rates, you know, 1% um, if you put up enough collateral. Wow. And, wow. and that's, yeah, I looked into that and I was like, I, um, you Crazy. Know, just think about refinancing your student loans. If you have enough crypto from, you know, buying it back in the day, yeah, you, seriously. Could, you could just refinance on your own and it's done all on chain. Um, now there's, there's risks, right? The, the platform could close. <laughs> they could take your, your crypto and then um, you can't get it back. Uh, or you could sort of lose your money, lose your, lose your, lose your position, or the market could crash and everyone gets liquidated. Um, so, it's, you know, there's risks involved, but that, that's one way that if you really wanted to spend money um, and didn't want to pay taxes, you could instead opt to pay interest. Um, but that is hmm. something that some people do. Uh, I, just want, Thank you. I just want to follow up on the NFT question that he had a while back. Um, I'm not I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, Axie Infinity. This this game that uh, uses NFT, where you can use another NFT to breathe more NFT and use the NFT to form uh, tokens, and you can use those NFT and give it to other people that they can, base you can basically employ them to farm the scholarship the, uh, program. Yep. The yeah the scholarship uh, basically farm everything else for you. So. Uh, what I want to know is, uh, one, is it going to be taxed as a business because basically I'm employing people? And two, how would, how would uh, the minting, the NFTs through breeding uh, be taxed? Um, so, yes, you should be tracking your, your scholars as employees. Um, there are tax forms you should be giving them. You should be tracking for your own purposes. Um, generally, when they earn the small love potions, you know, it's going to be tied to your account. And um, you need to sort of flag to the IRS and say, well, no, I didn't actually keep all of this. This is someone else's. So yes, it is a business. You should be tracking that. Um, and, and you would have to be paying your, I'm assuming, contractors or employees, depending on how you want to register them um, or treat them. Um, you, would, you would pay them their, you know, cut, and then you would have to keep track on your end. Um, the second question was um, minting the the new the new Axie. Um, you could let me think here. So you pay Love Potions, and then you use two Axie to get a single other Axie. Is that right? Yep. Well, one now. Uh, just one Axie can breed now. Yeah. Okay. So that would be uh, sort of a mint. So it'd be a buy of that new Axie, but the cost basis would be the price of the love potion that you sort of spent on it. Uh, and that would sort of set your cost base in that new Axie uh, because you're sort of creating something new. Um, but for, for, for accounting purposes, you are spending that, that small love potion. So you need to realize the gains of whatever the difference was from when you, you received that, that small love potion to when you spend it. And then you'll also enter that new Axie into your holdings. Uh, to follow up on that question, um, since we don't have access to uh, Binance uh, th directly through Ronin, so what I uh, what I usually do is I, I give a certain person my SL like the token SLP, and I have him convert it to another token. So that means the trade that he did is not under my uh, my name, so I wouldn't be taxed as, uh, with capital gains or business gains with that. And when he gives it back to me with a different token, uh, how would how would I uh, exactly explain that to the IRS? Because um, I technically, yeah. it, it looked like I technically gifted it to him and then he gave it back. It is a different form of token. I, I would say that you didn't you didn't gift it to him because a gift needs to be no strings attached. So uh, it really oh, just sounds true. like it sounds like a trade being done in a custodial manner on your behalf. And so, if you could track, you know what it was, uh, you know at the moment he traded it. Uh, if he if he had his own wallet for you to do these transactions, um, then maybe he can give that to you. Uh, alternatively, uh, whatever you know, depending on the timing of it, right? If it's happening all within a few minutes or a couple hours, you could possibly say, "I'm giving him a hundred dollars worth of crypto. I'm receiving back one hundred and eight dollars worth of crypto," and sort of make the trade depending on what you gifted out and what you got back in. 
Um, but that's that's really where you need a CPA to sort of sort through that because you're now parsing together to, to correct for missing information. But uh, I wouldn't say that those transactions weren't yours because then on the flip side, um, the IRS could also say that you, uh, let's say you spent it leaving because you don't know where it went or you're going to say I gifted it to somebody and then it's going to give you something back that just doesn't add up. So they could say, um, you know, or the alternative would be anything coming into your account that you sort of don't don't track is is income, and you don't want to pay income tax on it. So you'd be better off just saying it was a trade, and then seeing what data you have access to. Um, and and you know, if if, if your buddy is willing to share it, that'd be awesome. But uh, the other issue would be if he's realizing the trades in his account, and his country is being reported. You know, the finance is responding to their country, or he owes money. Um, he could be on the line for that transaction, uh, just the same as you are. So it's not always as easy as, oh, it's not tied to my KYC. It's not tied to my social security number because uh, there are other impacts even for other countries. You know, So it's something so to think about. Would, uh, would the change to, through the trade, like say the value increase, would that be capital gain or is it still going to be part of the business? Because technically the, the token acquired was still part of the, the scholarship. Um, so if you're trading like a business, uh, you know, your sort of expenses and gains are, are, you know, taxes sort of business related, but the capital gains is different than income. So if someone wins a turn, you know, wins a game and you earn that SLP, that's sort of income, but that sort of trade, um, there's different types of LLCs. So it, it might depend, but if you're just doing this all in your own name, you know, you can treat it like a business and for your own purposes. But if you're getting to substantial amounts of, of scholars, you know, some people make upwards of $10,000 a month doing this, this Axie stuff, um, you really should get a real accounting plan and like different wallets and, and set it all up that way. Because it's easy to say sort of in the abstract what things maybe should be, could be. But at the end of the day, there's things tied to you um, that you need to sort of dot the T's and cross the I's on it. Uh, to make sure that you're you're sort of uh, in compliance with all this stuff. So, would you suggest incorporating instead of just filing it under my own name? Um, well, I mean, just just if you had a separate silo of transactions, it would make it easier to track your non axi transactions. Um, and that's that's one thing. And there, it's possible if you were to set up an LLC with an S corp, that you could sort of benefit from taking corporate get, uh, corporate tax rates. But that's something that you'll need to talk to a tax professional and see if it makes sense for you, because it doesn't always make sense. But generally, if you have employees, um, you know, there's also liability concerns. If you're doing it under your own name, even if it's not a tax thing, right? Even if you're going to pay taxes anyways, because it's a it's a solely owned corporation, uh, it's a pass through. One of your employees might sue you because they feel they got slighted, and then they'll sue you and try to take your car, as opposed to just suing the company that employs them. And so there's this sort of legal liability uh, that if you have a corporate uh, structure and you you respect the corporate structure, meaning you don't move your assets in and out, like, you know, like it's your personal account, you treat it like a business, you really do stick to it. Um, if there's ever a lawsuit or something like that, something goes south, um, you have a little bit more protection there than if you're doing it under your own name. But, you know, that's, that's sort of the, the benefit of LLCs goes beyond taxes, I guess, is sort of the, the, the lesson there especially if you're employing people. Not sure. Well, I got to talk to my um, accountant then. Thank you for answering my question. You're welcome. Can you talk a little bit about if you haven't already business versus personal in terms of cap gains? Like if somebody does say 75 to hundred trades a year and, um, and they're declaring them as capital gains, uh, you know, is it easy for the IRS to go, no, this is business income? Um, they, they, they wouldn't, I mean, 75 to hundred is pretty light activity generally. Um, okay. and if you're willing to pay personal tech, you know, capital gains on it, uh, generally personally, you'll get, you get taxed a little bit more. Uh, it depends on the type of activity though. Cause sometimes, you know, if you're mining, it might make sense to do it within the corporate structure a little bit more, but if you're mm -hmm. truly just trading, you know, straight trades, buys and holds, um, you know, it, it may not even make sense to do it through some sort of business structure, but the IRS isn't really 
uh, at least in my experience, that granular going, oh, no, no, this should be a business. This isn't it. Um, they're, they're more, um, you know, are you paying enough taxes? Are you reporting everything properly? Because uh, at this rate, you know, they got really embarrassed in front of Congress a couple of years ago when they sort of came out with that report saying like 3% of crypto holders or something like that, not even, were reporting yeah. their crypto taxes. And so um, if you're trying, if you're if you're making, you know, if you're close, if you're doing it as best as you can, um, the, the odds of the IRS coming in and sort of with a fine tooth comb, um, unless you're just randomly selected for an audit, which does happen, it doesn't always have to have a reason, um, you know, they're not going to be looking for every Satoshi uh, and seeing how it was registered. But, uh, um, you know, if you treat it like a business, there there are benefits to treating it like a business. You, know, you can write off your yeah. expenses. But if it's just a hobby that makes money, just, you're probably better off just treating it like a hobby that makes money and filing it under your own name. Yeah. Cool. And is last question, is your contact info in somewhere in the thread? Um, it is not. I'm trying not to dox myself. But um, if you'd like, just shoot me a DM and... Uh, I can see what you need or what can I help you need and see if I'm a good fit. Okay. So. Thank you. May I jump in on that? Sure. Want to box yourself? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. Oh, Sorry. No. <laughs> they, uh, one started mining and they acquired a decent amount of hardware, but just like, uh, you know, thousands per se. And you want to switch over to the business side of that. Uh, how would you go about doing that? Say, because, you know, you acquired them at a cost. And then when you switch them over to business, how would you uh, transact that? Um, you'd probably do that with um, your, your corporate attorney <laughs> setting up your business because uh, you you need to sort of move those assets within the corporate structure. So, you know, it's possible if it's done, you know, in your basement or something, or your garage, that it's, it's really just on paper. But if it's going to be a business asset, you'll need to know, uh, you know sort of what it bought it at, um, things like that, and then add it into the, the sort of the business sort of structure there. Um, the exact way you do that is you sort of say, these are now the assets within the business and you just add them to it. Um, but it's, obviously it's simpler or it's not as simple as that. But if this is something you're looking into and you've already sort of invested um, somewhat heavily into that, uh, you definitely need to talk to somebody that sort of has experience with this because um, it's it's one of those things where I can sort of try to explain it now and I could be leaving something on the table they're not aware of. So definitely reach out to somebody. All right, we'll do that. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I have a question about how the IRS audits. Sure. So how exactly can they audit you if you're trading on a foreign exchange in USDT and your social security is not associated with it? Um. So to sort of echo the... Uh, the question as to how they can control crypto. Uh, they are the sovereign and you are subject no, no, to their sorry. laws. I'm not, I'm not no, I know, I know, I know. I'm not being facetious. So uh, how how can they? Well, when you I'm file your like, taxes. How can they track you? If you don't right. Yeah, like technically, you. like if I use Monero or something like that, how technically can they track me? Uh, I mean, if you, if you ever cash out or interact with anything, um, how they track you is they'll get you eventually is, is, is the answer. Uh, if you ever want to spend something uh, with your crypto or buy something with your crypto, uh, they might get you. And this happens all the time with just general white collar crimes, embezzlement. Uh, they might not catch you right now, but in five years when you have a lake house and they say, where'd you get your money at? Uh, you know, you're being audited, open yeah. your books. Sure. And the other thing to be considerate of is, uh, this is a big thing in the crypto space is how can they prove it? And it's, they don't need to prove necessarily every transaction you've done. If they catch whiff that maybe you didn't report your taxes properly, then they open you up to audit. And then if you're going to lie on your audit after they think you maybe lied on your taxes, allegedly, um, that brings a whole different issue and it stops being about your taxes uh, you know, what you owed, and it starts being about the fact that you didn't report your taxes properly. And when you're under audit, it's just going to be a huge headache. Um, but to answer your question, if you, you know, will they catch everyone who's ever had crypto? Maybe not. But is it worth not reporting now 
uh, and then in 10 years, in 10 years, you have $20 million and you have to go back and like square up, yeah. uh, you know, and that's sort of what a lot of uh, you know, my clients sort of deal with is they don't think about it. And then now they're sitting on millions of dollars and they have to sort of, you know, they ask, how do I pay this? And it's, well, you pay it as accurately as we can so that the IRS doesn't have to ask any other questions. Uh, and that's, that's honestly cheaper than getting a letter from the IRS saying you're being audited because then it becomes a much more complicated uh, situation. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, jump in on that. As someone that does hundreds of transactions a day sometimes, as long as one reports it as accurate as possible, say there's some discretions later and they try to audit you, would there be any leeway for that, given the fact that you actively try to keep everything in order? Or how does that... Or, um, yeah, so there are certain accounting accounting standards. So say you don't know where, you know, say you don't know where the crypto went, you, know, you just don't remember. Um, one way you could avoid that is just by saying it's a spend, right? You could just say, I don't know where it went, um, so I must have spent it. And then you sort of take it on the chin there, you pay a little bit extra in taxes. That's what they'll expect you to do. Um, and so if you were audited and there were sort of these unmatched you know, deposits and withdrawals in your account, um, they might flag those and say, where was this going? Where was this coming from? And if your answer is, I don't know, they'll sort of look at the accounting standards and say, well, you know, we said you have to treat it as a spend. You, we said you have to treat it as income. Um, and so that could be the adjustment. And then it, it really does come down to though, what is the discrepancy uh, between, you know, how big is it? Because the the sort of the, the general standard for the IRS for like auditing is, uh, was it a substantial underreport? Uh, it's not like a, there's no there's no number there. It's it's really a I think it's roughly twenty five percent or something like that. And so no. if if you go in and there's you know tens of thousands of dollars just sitting out there, they'll say what is this? But if it's ten dollars, right? If it's a small you know gift to a buddy for five bucks, you just forgot. Um, you know you should try your best, but you know there's also sort of just the the cost benefit analysis, are you going to spend 10 hours tracking everything down the blockchain over $10? I mean, they would understand like you just round, you know, round it up. <laughs> but if you're really, if you're really worried about that though, when you do have those discrepancies, just default to the most conservative tax position, which is if it's coming into your possession, it's, it's income. And if it's leaving, it's a spend. And if it's really a small discrepancy and it'll have very little impact on your taxes, uh, but if it starts becoming larger than that, then that's when you sort of reach out to a professional and see what you can do, what your other options are. Because, uh, you know, you might think there's no other option, but maybe there's something you can do. Uh, vice versa, you might think there's something you can do, and the tax professional might tell you, like, hey, there's really nothing you can do. Just pay pay a little extra because, you know, it depends on your risk tolerance. If the IRS looks at your file and there's a bunch of gaps in it, they're going to ask questions. And so it's better to fill those as early as possible. Relevant to that, then... Would it be better to count every single transaction, even those when you move from wallet to wallet per se, as a uh, as a you know transaction? If you were to be consistent with it, but like do every single transaction in the year? Uh, no. Would that be, oh, that would just incur because uh, you know, there's such a thing as unrealized gains. So if you held it in the price, you know, like this year, if you bought ETH, uh, you know, at the dip, I forgot how low it got, but now it's at all time highs. If you treat every de every withdrawal into one of your own wallets as a sale, um, you're gonna realize those gains and then you'll never qualify for long-term capital gains. And so, um, you know, you do need to track between your wallets as well because uh, if you sort of have a missing wallet somewhere and, you know, and ETH is pretty easy because you can track on the blockchain pretty, pretty quickly, but like for things like Bitcoin or someone mentioned Monero, if you don't have access to the, you know, the actual data, it's very difficult to track. And then that could leave you in a really bad tax situation uh, later on. How bad could the tax situation be if you do most of your transactions in Monero and you use maybe say Godex as a, a way to facilitate a lot of your transactions? I mean, the worst it could be is you go to jail and then they audit you. I mean, that's, it's, I don't sure, know. How, how would, you were they, asking, find, how would but, they find out? I mean, really? I mean, I'm not saying that I do this, but like, how would they sure. find out? No, I know a lot of people, I posted over at the Monero subreddit. I know what they think about taxes. Um, 
they, you know, how bad could it be? Well, if they ever do catch you, it could be really bad, you know, because it's it's pretty much you're using a privacy coin, you're not reporting it. And if they do catch you, um, you know, they sort of have an argument to say, you know, this wasn't just a minor oopsie daisy. This person actively didn't pay their taxes. And and that sort of that that mental element does play into it. And and so it's now, and I'd say this, I've been around long enough, back in the early days before they even, you know, flagged crypto as property, there was a question, was it property, is it money, is it foreign currency? Um, you know, back then you could argue, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know any better, I didn't have to pay taxes. Um, I'd say even 2017, some people were saying, well, I didn't know I had to pay taxes. You know, it's 2021, you're sort of at the point where, you know, if the argument is how would they catch this transaction, you're already sort of entering the realm of, this is no longer a honest mistake, right? And so how bad could it get? I mean, if you get caught, it'll be as bad as they wish to prosecute, you know, as far as the taxes go. Uh, but uh, you're right. There may be some blockchains somewhere that they, they won't uh, crack for a while, but that's not as a tax lawyer or something, you know, I would ever advise <laughs> to rely on because I know that the IRS does have a team of tax professionals that are you know, you know, know, probably in a building somewhere in, in Virginia or DC, and they advise the tax agents um, how to audit crypto people. And they they sort of you know, know what questions to ask. They know what data they're looking at and they'll know exactly what to, to sort of request. And so, you know, is the IRS fully on board with crypto yet? No, but do they have the capability to you know, properly audit somebody that they've already got in their sites, they absolutely do. So, yeah. Great. Thank you, Thank you so much for answering. Anyone else has any questions? We're just rounding up the talk. Yeah, I, one more quick question. Um, are you aware of the change, the crypto changes in the new infrastructure bill? Um, yes, we sort of touched on this at the, the, the opening. Oh, um, okay. It's yeah. all right. I don't want to repeat stuff. You, you. I'm sure you're tired. <laughs> uh, one question I had as well was: um, Are are you familiar with uh, the IRS using any sort of matching software between 1099Bs that are issued and 8949s that are filed by users? And is there any sort of like? Um, gap between those two reporting methods that you think would be significant enough to be concerned about? Um, yeah, so that sort of comes up sometimes where if you had a large amount of money going through an exchange, they'll tell the IRS, you know, this person transacted $400,000 last year, and then you file your 849 and you're, uh, you know, you're not reporting that much in transactions. I'm not sure if they have a specific software for it, but I know they sort of will look to see, hey, we expected a large amount of transactions uh, and there's, you know, you reported very little or none. Um, and I'd say this is a, a big concern if, uh, if you ever like trade on someone's behalf, right? You collect money from your family. Hey, we're all gonna buy crypto. Oh, I already have an account. And you sort of run it through there. Uh, technically, you know, was it your money? Um, not really. It was someone else's, even if the crypto went to their wallet right away. But the you know the exchange doesn't know that, the IRS doesn't know that, and then when you file your crypto you know returns, you file your returns in your nine forty nine, it may not if you don't include those transactions, um, they might flag that as a reason to question you further. And generally, when when we're sort of doing people's taxes for their crypto transactions, the goal is to provide all the information so that the IRS has as little reason as possible to inquire further. And so, um, yeah, I mean, generally, I don't know if they have a software you know, necessarily, but they will sort of expect certain things. And then if they don't see it, that might be a couple extra points towards, you know, maybe this guy needs an audit. But, you know, there, there are completely legitimate reasons why someone might show from an exchange standpoint, a lot more crypto being traded than they actually did. Um, and, you know, it's completely legitimate. It would be completely, you know, sort of honest, like not trying to do anything, you know, under the table. Uh, and so it's really important to sort of segment your personal from family. You know, we sort of advise if you're going to hold someone else's crypto, you know, first try not to, and second, make a fresh wallet, make a different sub account, you know, separate everything because it makes accounting for it a lot easier. And if you are ever flagged, 
uh, or this exact situation, um, then you could show the IRS, hey, here's a sub account. That was my mom's money. My mom also filed her taxes. And there you go. Like, we're good. Um, and that's just something to be aware of. Uh, how long was that? Sorry. Yeah. Do you have Do you have another question? Uh, say that does happen. How long would that clarification take? Uh, if the IRS were to ask those questions. Yes. Um, it 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 really depends on uh, if they send you a letter and they they just ask you a very specific question. Um, you know, obviously you'd want to talk to a tax professional uh, to help you sort of navigate that. But uh, if it's if it's really just probing for more data, you might be able to provide it all to them sort of upfront, and say, "Here's my record. You know, here's the transactions in question. You know, I would I wouldn't give them more than they ask for. Uh, but that's just sort of a, a strategy thing. But it's possible you could you could have it you know answered and rectified in weeks to months. Um, and if it sort of stretches on into more of a full investigation audit, it could take a long time. But that's why it is is better, like I said, to set up your taxes ahead of time so that they have no reason to ask questions. And I guess while we're on the topic, if you were to say not uh, report your taxes, it would be a best idea to know what you should have because it's also faster to uh, resolve an audit if you did keep you know records. But that's sort of the issue there is you know. So theoretically speaking. If one has a sex and then they move it on over to a DEX and they don't ever really push anything back from that DEX into the sex, could you count that as, say, a sale per se and treat the other one as a sub account? Um, I wouldn't treat it as a sale. I would treat it as a self transfer and then just don't, you know, do that. And a lot of people do that. A lot of people have a one way fiat on ramp, it's usually Coinbase or Binance or something. And they just put their cash in one. They send it immediately to the the, the decentralized exchanges, and they they trade on that for 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 years. And because that's really where the innovation's at. And so, that's not yeah, uncommon. So if but, you do uh, that, would you then be able to do taxes, say, when you pull out years from now, or? Uh, no, you should track every transaction and report your your gains. You know, your transactions yearly, even if you're not pulling out fiat. You should, you have the obligation to report exists no matter where the trade happens. It could happen over, it could happen with cash in a bar, you know, or at a coffee shop, uh, an over the counter transaction is also reportable. And so the obligation exists regardless of what, um, you know, the IRS can immediately see on, on, you know, the centralized exchanges, but also, um, you know, just generally, you know, what you sort of are trading and you have the obligation to, 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 to report it. All right. Great. Thank you all for the questions. Thank you, Crypto Tax Lawyer, for joining us and answering all the questions. There are definitely Thank quite you. a lot of questions here. And I think we've covered all the topics, especially the substantial topics and the questions that users have already asked. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And once again, a big thanks for Crypto Tax Lawyer for doing this. Awesome. Until next if, time. if anyone has any other questions, Thank um, you. Feel free to DM me or maybe on the cryptocurrency subreddit, we can do sort of a text-based uh, AMA and I'll just sort of answer questions there. But uh, yeah, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Great. Uh, awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you for answering all our questions. Thank, Thank you. Good night, guys. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Blue brain.